It is my pleasure and honor here to uh, be speaking with Chris Malakowski, co-founder of NVIDIA. So let's just dive right in. So the idea for NVIDIA was first discussed in 1993 in a Denny's in Silicon Valley, where Chris and his colleague Curtis Priam, who were at Sun Microsystems, met up with their friend at the time, Jensen Wong. And a few questions here. So first off, um, why, why Denny's? <laughs> why not Denny's? <laughs> um, Denny's happened to be near Jensen's home. We were all working at the time trying to figure out what this company we wanted to start was going to be about. Um, and Denny's had this nice uh, feature for about to be unemployed people, uh, endless cup of coffee. Wow. So uh, we would uh, drink coffee uh, for hours, not eat much food. Um, and talk through our strategies. So, Denny's worked out nicely. Oh wow! So it wasn't the 199 Grand Slam. It wasn't the 199 home. Grand Slam. <laughs> okay. Well, so take us to that moment. So you know, you're sitting at the table, you're drinking your coffee, uh, you're about to take off, and you've you know discussed Nvidia. At that moment, what are you most excited about? What do you see for Nvidia? Yeah. Well, the. Um, you know, we were all, the industry was at a nice uh, juncture. Uh, Windows um, 3.0 had come out. Um, Intel was moving up the microprocessor chain from 186, 286, 386. Um, and it, it seemed like we were coming out of the workstation world where you know, sort of high performance, high, high cost graphics were accepted and we were looking at the PC world where low cost and not performance had been kind of the norm, um, and we thought we had we had something that we could bring to the party. So it, it was a pretty pretty exciting time, pretty nerve wracking simultaneously. Anybody who's started something would know, and we all had families. Well, at least two of us had families that we were worried about. So uh, you know, we were going to dive in and we we're going to give it our best shot. Wow, so cost seemed to be the key differentiator with the PC, low cost. Yeah, I mean, that, that's sort of what it characterized it. In, in the graphics space, no one had sort of sustained a lead for very long because the next guy would come along with a little bit cheaper and that, was, that would win the day. So we, we were hoping to change that game. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so what were those initial signs that you were changing the game in those early years? Um, you know, the... Uh, we, we ended up doing our first product, and it was optimized for the conditions at the time. Um, and it got, so the conditions at the time were um, expensive memories, not very good uh, I.O. bandwidth, um, um, not a lot of math on the microprocessor, though it was improving. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we built a, we, we chose a style of graphics that optimized for that. Um, and when we first introduced the product, we got all this fanfare. We're in all the, the, the uh, industry magazines uh, touted as, you know, somebody trying something new, and, um, and that seemed great at the time. Mm. Turned out it wasn't, but we didn't know it yet. Oh, interesting. So, oh, more. Um, our first product turned out to be pretty much a flop, um, and it turned out to be the best thing going. Um, we, we came out with this product, we were intriguing enough, we were invited into all the customers we, we wanted to visit, um, and they told us why they couldn't buy an all-in-one device. We were graphics and, and video and, and game controller and audio, wavetable audio, all in one device, and it was going to be great for the consumer. One, one device driver you load, everything would work, least common denominator. Just didn't know the Dells, the Gateways, the Microns couldn't buy that. Mm. They, and we were told why they couldn't buy that and why this wasn't the device for them. So when we finally came and did our second generation, we built the product the market wanted. And we had learned a valuable lesson um, that maybe hopefully all you know, you're not in business to, to, uh, to make your ideas come true. You're really there to try to make your customers successful. And we were, we, were, we were very hot on our technology 
but it wasn't going to help our customer, it was going to help their customer. And we kind of missed the, the connection that we had to first sell to you know, the, the middleman, our customer. Um, and that lesson set the grounds for future success, I think. Wow, so you thought you had product market fit, and according to the media, uh, yeah. it sounded like you did, and then you realized once you started talking to customers, doing customer discovery, that yeah. indeed you did not. Yeah, and wow. you know, we um. kind of missed the mark. Yeah, so you describe one challenge here, this product market fit. Um, you know, every founding team faces setbacks. Um, and so what were some, some of these other hard moments that you experienced at NVIDIA, and how, how did you maintain resilience within the team? Yeah, um, well, I mean, that, that was a hard lesson to learn. We had already started into our second generation before we realized the market didn't want what we were pitching. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we had a choice to make, so we opted to reset and build what the market was asking for, and just instead of be, trying to outsmart our competition, we were just going to out, out engineer them. Um, so that was that was that was tough, and uh, we had, you know, we built our company on the backs of hiring what we thought were the best people we could find, always raising the average. Um, and when we started doing the second generation, we had this headwind of all this press that said we were off to the races. Um, we had hired sort of in mass to, 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 to supplement the, uh, the team. Um, and then we decided, oh, wrong, wrong thing, we need to go reset. We went back to the original team and we had a reduction in force, a layoff of, of I don't know, 40, 50 people. Um, big, big, big observation, nothing changed. Hmm. Turns out when you don't surround your people with their, their, their you know, their, their equivalent, their, uh, somebody that they want to work with. They work harder to overcome the deficiencies of the new people we brought in. When we uh, reset, everybody just did their own job, not just their job and somebody else's job. And it, it was another big lesson. You know, we chose to build our company that way, then we have to, we should honor that for the people we already hired. Um, and, and surround them with equally great people. Wow. Okay, so you, you mentioned you're now on Gen 2. This is getting real product market fit. And so now you're kind of getting into the mode where you're scaling. I uh, just so want to stay on that topic for a bit more. So, you know, in scaling NVIDIA, NVIDIA from the startup to this global leader, like what were some of the foundational decisions around the technology or the process that were critical to sustaining that long-term growth? Well, a couple things. One, you know, we decided that we were going to put our customers first and not our desire to you know, produce new technology. Mm -hmm. That helped. Um, we embraced the standards where we were sort of bucking the standards and there weren't standards actually when we started, but they had emerged, so we decided to embrace the standards. Um, and then we built our technology um, with the eye that we were going to succeed. So we, we made investments that were longer term, even if we went out of business along the way. <laughs> um, it what didn't change the way we looked at it, that we were bullish on ourselves and our chances, and that we're going to make you know, investments that would pay off in the long run, if there was a long run. Um, but you know, we, we, had, you know, we had chips that didn't yield and, and, and uh, you know, things that were late and you know, lot, lots of the typical you know, headwinds that a startup would go through. Um, and you know, we were pretty good at just putting our head down and plowing through. Yeah, you mentioned this balancing of the long term of you know, investing in the long term versus the near term of you know, getting the product out the door. How did you think about balancing resources in that way? Was there like an 80, 20? Well, I'm not sure we had an algorithm that, that sophisticated. <laughs> there was actually <laughs> numerics around it. Um, <laughs> The, uh, you know, our, you know we, had, we had a vision, we had a, an aspiration. And even if we were deviating from the aspiration, we kind of knew it. Mm -hmm. And we would do that consciously. So the, um, you know, we mostly tried to aim towards the aspiration, which was to start off with, you know, be the most important graphics company in the world, and, and you know, ultimately to be the most important technology company in the world. And it was, it was arrogant and, 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 you know, seemed silly at the time, but it, but it helped guide us. And I, I think, you know, you got to believe. And if you, you know, if you don't have that vision, you're not going to achieve it. 
Yeah. Wow. Okay. So a lot of uh, bullish optimism, pushing forward, believing in yourself, yeah. vision. Na- naivety is good for, uh, for founders and entrepreneurs. You know, you just, you just, yeah. you just got to believe. Yeah. Um, Want to talk about co-founder dynamics? So, some co-founder dynamics can sometimes be the bane of a company's existence. And many <laughs> investors talk about, you know, co-founder teams being the reason why a company doesn't um, go forth. So, what were some of the frameworks or ways in which you, Curtis and Jensen, really made sure that your dynamics would not get in the way of Nvidia's growth? I mean, the the, the really good thing about our our friendship and then ultimately partnership was that. We kind of each had, had a lane that we were, you know, initially, you know, plowing ahead in. I, you know, Jensen was, you know, Curtis and I asked Jensen to help us with the business plan because we were technologists. We didn't really, under, you know, we weren't in the business world. Jensen, who's a phenomenal technologist, had just moved his career into technology licensing and and and, uh, and management. Um, Curtis is is and was, you know, that's brilliant. Uh, algorithm and, and, you know, sort of system architect I'd ever worked with. And, you know, my role was to build it. And, and the fact that we allowed each other to sort of stay in our lanes and, you know, each supporting the other because we could do some of the other's job, but we didn't, you know, what, we, we trusted each other. And, and it turned out to be, you know, trust well placed. Yeah. And you mentioned to me previously that, um, you know, you and Curtis were never part of the board. Correct. Do you want to talk um, about that? And this, I mean, I, you know, first of all, our founding was 30 something years ago, so I really don't know what the, the status quo is now, but um, we, were, we were directed, you know, when we raised uh, venture capital money, some of the principals in the VC firms asked that Curtis and I not be on the board that uh, just Jensen and their rationale was that they wanted to be able to take them into a room and, you know, criticize them and, you know, ridicule and whatever and teach him and that he needed to walk out of the room and still have credibility and authority. And, um, you know, it was, the t- well, I mean, there was so- some angst over that over the years, but really it turned out not to be a problem. Yeah. And then what would you say for founders today to you know, really set their companies up for scalability and resilience, either with the founding team or within the broader company. Yeah, I, you know, one of the things we did when we started the company is we spent, I don't know, equal amount of time, but certainly significant amount of time talking about the company we wanted to have. Mm. We had all come out of large companies um, and, and had a, a, a good bit of experience in, in, in different organizations. And so we talked about culture and argued about it and you know, discussed what, what about culture would be best fit for our personalities. Mm-hmm. Um, and and we, we, we settled on something that was a good fit for, all, for us. And when we hired, we hired, we tried to hire consistent with that. And so, you know, we were, we were you know, I guess you could say, you know, we're hiring for aptitude, but also attitude. That, that the people that we brought in you know, yes, we, we wanted their skills and their, their, their knowledge and their um, experience to be, you know, top notch, but we, they also had to get along and get along with people and want to make a team succeed and make the company succeed. Um, and I think paying it, there, who was it, Peter Drucker or something said that, you know, culture will, culture will beat strategy, you know, every day. Um, I think there's a lot to it that, you know, the, uh, having a culture that you don't have to put signs up on the wall to promote, that the people, you know, are, it's innate in the way they do, do their day-to-day work, um, how they get along with people, how they compete, um, I think really helped. I think, so I, I think one of them is, you know, having a culture that you can be consistent with and hiring consistent with it, so that everybody, even though everybody's different and comes at it from a different point of view, that there's something that, that binds you together I think that's something. Um, I think having a long-term outlook so you can make investments, not just spend money, but make investments that promote uh, that long-term investment. And I think, you know, having, developing a trust in each other. I mean, the, uh, the nature of startups is, you know, a problem a minute, right? It comes at you fast and furious. And, you know, the people 
you know, I, I digress a second, but I, I used to like to, when I was interviewing people, to, um, they say, you know, what, what are you looking for? I said, well, I'm looking for the Michael Jordans, maybe Steph Curry's or whatever. <laughs> um, and I wasn't trying to say we needed the superstar. What I was really trying to imply is I wanted people that wanted the ball in the last two minutes of the game. Mm -hmm. that, that, you know, you didn't, you were not afraid to have it all rest on your shoulders. That, that you were confident enough, self-confident enough, uh, bullish in yourself enough that it's okay to count on you when the chips might be down. Um, and we tried to instill that in every department. Uh, you know, at this point in my career, I've managed most uh, technical departments at NVIDIA. Um, and each one of them we set up to be, you know, an offensive weapon, so to speak. We just don't know when it's going to matter, whether it's operations getting a little more yield or, or uh, you know, marketing coming up with a campaign or sales doing some campaign or legal doing something or, um, you know, IT having more uptime than next, you know, our competitors. Everybody, you know, all the departments were set up to be, you know, top notch and to carry the day when the day is for their, you know, their number is called. So I think that's all so also things that can help the endurance and the, the ability to respond to all these you know, threats and challenges that are inevitable in the startup world. Yeah, absolutely. So it seems like in both in interviewing and in team development, kind of having each team be focused on being able to pick up the ball in the last two minutes of the game, as you mentioned, of like being the hero, being the one that carries the rest of the company yeah. and helps out the other departments. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, it's an attitude, it's part of the culture, actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit more about culture as well. So, you know, um, you mentioned that uh, in, a, in a prior conversation, you mentioned that good leaders have a bias toward action. How did that filter down to your team, and how did you put guardrails around that yeah. sentiment? So, first of all, I, I got that, that term from a, a book by Meg Whitman, um, who's t who described her mother that way. And it just it just resonated with me, you know. I think bias towards action, you know. The um, I'm, I'm a pilot, and there's a pilot saying about um, um, good judgment is the result of experience, but experience is the result of bad judgment. You got to do something to know. You got to respect. I mean, we all love to acknowledge and pride ourselves on what we know, but you got to respect what you don't know. And the way you learn what you don't know is you go do it. And, you, you know, analysis by paralysis uh, or, you know, I was thinking about it last night. It's kind of the, um, like the, the minimum viable product idea, mm -hmm. just reconstituted in a different way. Yeah. Um, you need, you know, you should get your ideas out there, get them vetted, get them criticized. And, and, and so that, that's the do something. Don't just sit around and, and try to perfect it and, you know, polish it until you know that's even the right idea, because a lot of them aren't. Yeah, like you mentioned, your first Gen 1 yeah. uh, didn't have the right product market fit there. Yeah. Um, want to talk a little bit about uh, advice. Um, so we have lots of students and early stage founders in the audience. Um, looking back over the past three decades, um, first let's start off with any books or talks that you heard of or read that had a profound impact on you? Yeah, I mean, the, um, there was one, uh, there, I don't remember whether it was a talk or the book I read, but Peter Drucker about um, um, management is doing the right things and leadership is, no, no, management is about doing things right and leadership is about doing the right things. Um, that struck me. I mean, I was, you know, I was sort of good engineer, good, good leader, but I was a reluctant manager. And it's something I had to learn to do and learn to do well because I owed it to you know, our employees. Um, so that was one. You know, I remember Clay Christensen's talks about how you know we were we were the the startup that wanted to overtake the the giant. Mm -hmm. So you know the, yep. the the talk about how how you can you know eat from below I guess struck me and then it also worries me now mm -hmm. um, as other people read it. And is that um, Innovator's Dilemma that you're referring yeah, to? Yeah, uh, yeah but I, I, I saw him give a talk was the thing that most got me. Um, and then there was another book by one of his students called um, um, Stephen Spears and I can't trying to think of the name of the book right now. But basically it, um, it, it 
and this goes to the advice part too. Mm -hmm. um, he was telling the story of um, Ad Admiral Rickover, which was a U.S. admiral that uh, was credited with creating the nuclear navy. And he was telling the story in there um, that Rickover would not enter any negotiation without a fully thought out model of what both sides would bring to the table, how the conversation would go, and you know, what, what the pain points were, what the, you know, wh who was going to give on what point. And if any time during the negotiation it didn't go that way, he would step out of the room and reformulate a model of the way the rest of it would go. And th this, you know, the um, NVIDIA, we're, we're very fond of saying, you know, we like to derive things from first principles. It doesn't really matter how anybody else did it or what the norms are. We're going to take our circumstances and our realities and our needs and we're going to build up an answer. Our organization's not like anybody else's. Our management style's not like other people's. Our products are built a little different. Um, but the other thing that we do is, you know, and maybe this goes back again to the, the earlier question, but um, we envision what success looks like. And then you work backwards. So. You know, you asked about one of our challenges. One, you know, when we reset our company to build the product that the market was asking for, we, got to, we were going to show up um, well past when everybody else had been sampling their parts for that cycle. And, but at the time, the, 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 the mode of operation was, we called it spin to win. You show up with a prototype, it, it limps along, somebody agrees to use your part, you go spin it a few times and get it to work. We were going to be six months late, so our only choice was to make the first part production worthy. Hmm. So you start off with, what does it take to be production worthy on first spin? And you walk backwards, and we, you know, we, we developed all this infrastructure and all these systems in, in NVIDIA that emphasized getting it right the first time. Wow. And again, it's an investment for the future, but there's two ways of looking, you know, you can derive everything from bottoms up and, and customize it to your situation, or you can also start with the result you want and work backwards and you know, engineer the systems um, to get there. So I think that's another approach to, you know, for, for people to uh, look at for success. Um, for the students, you know, first of all, I've only started one company. It worked out, thank <laughs> goodness. Um, it was 30 years ago, so I, I, again, I can't swear my reality is yours. But I, I felt like I invested in my, in my background, in my sort of a corporate maturity until um, I was in my 30s. And then when NVIDIA showed up and we started it, you know, we had the, the sort of the, the experience and depth to, to know things we wanted to do and things we didn't know to, what to do. Um, it wasn't just technical, you know, brilliance um, that I think ended up being our key to success. I th you know, so I, I advise kids to, you know, what, you know get good at something because you're not going to get hired. But once you're good at something, do things with your colleagues. Learn all the disciplines around you to some degree so you can appreciate their, you know, their, uh, um, what helps them succeed and what they're worried about. Because it, you know, it's a team sport. I think product design and product success these days is a team sport and the better you understand your colleagues and can work together. It's not just a single you know, discipline. It's not you know, semi you know, semiconductor physics that's going to carry the day. You need all elements of the product teams and marketing and, you know, your whole corporate push to make something successful. Yeah, and really appreciate those comments. And I do want to acknowledge that uh, both you and your two co-founders have all given large gifts to uh, your alma maters and yours being University of Florida. And um, my understanding is it's a, a very large supercomputer and it really promotes interdisciplinary uh, work yeah. amongst the students. Which yeah, so I mean, and the idea there was the, um, well, first of all, if you're going to do something, as my wife advocated, do something you care about. Don't just spend money. Mm -hmm. um, but the, it, it's consistent with this, this, this supposition that, the, um, that it takes a village to build good products and, and, and successful technologies these days. And the idea of giving a supercomputer, and we gave the gift to the university, not to the, any department. Yeah. So it ended up putting AI across every discipline in the university, and it got all these departments to have to work together, you know, to, to, to exploit it. Um, and, you know, it's doing great science now, I'm quite proud of it. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, we only have about 25 seconds, so just really want to highlight some of the things you've said here. You know, started off with being very visionary and very bullish about the outcome and success, like investing in the long term and in the near term. Sounds like investing in your team, making sure you have the right team, the right skills, they work together. Culture matters a lot uh, in your, your interviewing and, and in team development. And then advice for everyone is to, you know, as a student, work in teams, like learn from each other. Again, culture as a student even matters. And as you go and start your companies, uh, go and change the world. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. A lot much. of fun. Yeah.